Hello folks. In this video we're going to take a look at differentiators. If you haven't already watched the video on integrators, might be a good idea to look at that one first. Okay, this is sort of the flip of the integrator, right? It differentiates. It finds the slope of an input waveform. And it is sort of the mirror image of our integrator. It also is based on an inverting amplifier. In this case, we put the capacitor in the RI position instead of in the RF position. So here's our V in, V out. And we have an input capacitor, which I'll call CI, and this feedback resistor, RF. Now the input voltage creates an input current. So for this polarity, we're going to see this. And that will, of course, flow through RF because the input current into the op amp is small enough to ignore, right? So it's going to go in and then through like EA. So our output voltage using this polarity, plus to minus, is essentially the inverted version of the voltage across the RF, right? Because this is a virtual ground. So from this point, we see minus to plus, which is basically what we have over here from this point to ground instead of virtual ground. So it's a flip. We can say that V out is equal to a negative V of RF. Now V of RF in turn, by Ohm's law, would have to equal the current through it times RF. I in is the capacitor current. And we know that I is equal to C dV dt. So we can say that I in must equal CI times D V N dt. And then all we have to do is a quick substitution and we find out that V out must be equal to a negative RF CI times dv and dt. All right, so it's the slope, the derivative of the input voltage scaled and inverted. All right, so there's this RFC uh, scaling factor and then the inversion. But basically it gives us the slope. Now, the frequency response of this, as you might expect, would be the opposite of what we see for the integrator. So the open loop response would look something like this. Now the closed loop, if you think of this as an inverting amplifier, right, RF over RI, RI in this case is X sub C, and we know as frequency goes up, X sub C gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So as frequency goes up, then the gain should be getting higher and higher and higher. And this is a perfect one-to-one -one ratio. In other words, we double the frequency where you are going to have X sub C, which means we're going to double the gain. And that will give us a increasing slope for the differentiator of 6 dB per octave. Now this will continue on up until we hit the open loop response and what ends up happening is we can get a we can get some instability and we can get a, a lot of high frequency noise so to help compensate for that we often put in a little capacitor right across the rf right because that i'll call it cf that is going to um, shunt rf at high frequencies and limit the high frequency gain and what will end up happening in that case is, just like with the integrator where we had an F low, we're going to end up with an F high. So this is going to kind of go like this. It's going to flatten out. And right here is F high. Right, that's the upper limit of differentiation. Differentiation occurs on the 6 dB per octave slope. So that gives us adding CF, right, limits the noise makes the system more stable. It creates an F high, which 
you know, we can call our quote unquote 50% accuracy point. That's just sort of a round figure. F high is equal to one over two pi RFCF, right? No surprise there. Just where is, where is that critical? So we want to operate below, right? We want to be down here. We have to operate below F high. If we're a decade below it, you'll have very high accuracy. You'll be about 99% accurate, um, assuming you're uh, using simple sine waves. Unlike a, an integrator, you could have a frequency down here, right, that you're differentiating, you get some signal. That waveform could have higher frequency harmonics. Some of those could fall outside this range. In other words, could fall out of uh, beyond F high, and that's going to reduce the accuracy. With an integrator, what ends up happening is um, we have an F low, so the harmonics are going to be higher and higher and higher. In other words, further and further away from F low. So we don't suffer that kind of problem. The integrator tends to be a better behaved, more accurate circuit. It does, however, have problems with, uh, you know, DC, DC offsets. This guy, uh, on the other hand, has sort of speed problems. You're going to need a high speed op amp, especially if you have you know, very dynamic, quickly changing waveforms. Um, otherwise, you're going to be suffering issues with uh, rise and fall times. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use sort of the mirror image of the one that we used in, um, in the integrator video. So I'm going to use the same components. 5K resistor there, a 20 nanofarad cap here, and then the shunting CF. I'm going to make that 1 nanofarad. Okay, the input waveform that we're going to look at is going to be a 100 millivolt, in other words, point, uh, point 0.1 volt peak sine wave at 200 hertz. All right, so we've got 100 millivolts at 200 hertz. That's our sine wave input. So the first thing we have to do is figure out what the heck is F high. We want to make sure we're well below that, you know, ideally at least a decade. If we, want, if we want this equation, right, if we want this equation to be accurate, you know, a decade below F high for our sine wave or lower. Okay, so F high we know is um, 1 over 2 pi RF CF. So RF and CF are 5K and uh, 1 nanofarad. And that works out to 31.8 kilohertz. So yeah, we are well, well below that with a 200 hertz input versus 31.8K, right? So here's our 31.8K over here. Our 200 hertz is way down here. Beauty. Okay, so let's calculate, see what we get. What's the formula say? Plug in the values. All right, so RF is uh, 5K. CI is uh, 20 nanofarads. Our input is the 100 millivolt sine wave at 200 hertz. Okay, the 5K 20 nanofarad turns into um, 10 to the minus fourth. And we can pull out the constant here. And if you uh, take the derivative of a sine wave, you get a cosine wave. Right, we just have the constant here to deal with. And 
now we can just combine up our goodies and we wind up with a negative 12.6 millivolts I'll write it down as e minus 3 times the cosine of 2 pi 200 t now as i said you know the the um, derivative of a sine wave is a cosine wave All right little memory jog over here here's your sine wave and you're saying what's the rate of change on this it's obviously really steep over here so you get a big number here the rate of change is zero here the rate of change is negative big here the rate of change is zero and then it just keeps right so it's obvious that's a cosine wave we wind up with a negative because again it's an inverting amplifier all right if that was an issue you know with whatever computation we're doing we could always run this through another inverting amplifier uh, get us back to the you know the true phase if you will all right so that's the way we would approach this with a sine wave what would we do if um you know we we had a more complicated wave now this is the same issue we had with with the integrator um, i throw in a square wave a triangle wave some other kind of thing you know a ramp function whatever it is how do i figure out figure out what the output is well you know you can you can do an infinite series the problem with doing an infinite series i mean you get the correct answer but if you don't know what that infinite series looks like you know that's a little bit of a pain so you know in the integrator we we um we looked at this using a piecewise approximation and then using a definite integral sort of to connect the pieces together well you can do the same thing here okay so if it's non-sign what we'll do is this piecewise approach so that we can see what it looks like so as an example For an input, we'll use, let's say, a triangle wave. Uh, let's make this 1K hertz. And 2.5 and volts peak to peak, right? One, one and a quarter volts peak. All right. So that looks like this. Give ourselves a little bit of space here. And so on and so forth. Okay, so this, if, if we go right peak to peak, right from negative peak to negative peak right here, that would be, because it's one kilohertz, one over that is one millisecond. All right, so halfway through would be half a millisecond. Right, this of course is zero. The amplitude, as we said, would be uh, one and a volt, one and a quarter volts peak. So from here to here, right, there's your two and a half volts peak to peak, and so on. Now. What we have to do is sort of describe this. Obviously, there's two pieces, this piece, this piece. How do I uh, you know, write an expression for that? Well, if we look at the first piece, the change is two and a half volts. Right? You're going from here to here. There's a two and a half volt change, and it's occurring in half a millisecond. Well, that's equivalent to 5,000 volts in a second, right? Because two and a half and a half would be five volts in one millisecond. So we just multiply that up 5,000 volts per second, which if you write that as an expression is 5,000 T, where T is in seconds. Now we can use that in our equation. All right, so we just say, hey, V out 
is the negative RFCI, dV and dt. Now we already know some of this. I'll just put the numbers in, but you know, that's 5k, 20 nanofarads. Vn you just write as 5000 T. Five K twenty nano. We already know that's um, ten to the minus four. And then when you obviously do this, you get your five thousand times that. You get a negative point five volts. So what you're really saying is during this time period. The slope, right, of 5,000 uh, volts per second produces, you know, a numeric value of, in this case, 0.5 volts. That's how it's scaled by this. And, of course, it's negative. This slope is constant during this time period, so this is indicating a constant value. Well, 2.5, that's a volt and a quarter, so half a volt's around here. So what you're saying is you're getting, you're getting this. Right, you're getting a constant DC value. Then, when we do it for this part, the only thing that changes is this turns into negative 5,000 volts per second, right, because you're going this way. And then we have a negative negative. This turns into a positive. So we end up with that. And obviously, there's just a little edge connecting those. Like so. So we wind up with a square wave. Right, we put in a triangle wave. We get out a square wave. Again, if you looked at the infinite series for a triangle wave, it would be this infinite series of cosines. And if, and if you um, uh, took the derivative of that, you'd get this infinite series of sine, wave, or of, of sine waves, um, which would turn into a square wave. Right? But again, unless you were familiar with the infinite series, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily know what it looks like. So this is a way of doing that. Right? You just get straight line pieces, figure out what each piece is, stitch them together, and there you go, right? So in the integrator, we, you know, we looked at the inverse of this. We, put, we, we threw in a, a square wave and we got a triangle wave out. So, hey, you put a triangle wave and you should get a square wave out, right, when you differentiate it. So it's sort of the mirror image process. All right? Okay, beautiful. There you have it.